ready now with budget hearing November 25th, 2019, <coughs> Justice Policy and Programs. Welcome, Director Daniels. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Um, good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm Michael Daniels, the Director of Justice Policy and Programs. I'm honored today to be here to present our 2019 accomplishments and our 2020 plans. Um, we are one of your smallest and mightiest agencies. Um, we are approximately 122nd the size of the Adam Board or 145th the size of the Children's <laughs> Services Board, but we make much cooler slides as <coughs> evidence yes, here. You do. Um, we are in charge of a variety of different things, including uh, grant management, reentry planning, violence prevention, mental health and substance use disorder treatment. We staff the county's two boards uh, responsible for criminal justice and reentry planning. You see on the right there is our most recent recruiting poster. Um, it has not been terribly effective. Um, our budget over the last three years has <clears throat> grown substantially. We became our own department in uh, July of 2017 after the 2018 federal budget cycle had closed. Um, in the two and a half years since then, or the two full grant cycles, we've grown our budget at 143%, um, and this has been via aggressive pursuit of the competitive and discretionary grants that our department administers. We continue to distribute the formula grants that are given to our department from the Department of Justice. Uh, these grants are calculated based on population and their use is very prescriptive, but between the Justice Assistance Grant, the Violence Against Women Act funding, and the Title II Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention dollars, uh, this is about $1.2 million per year for Franklin County that's administered through our office. Our discretionary and competitive grants, however, are where we've really made uh, an investment uh, of time and, and really made a commitment to do some different things. Um, just as an idea, this year our, our discretionary grant budget will be $2.9 million for the calendar year. In 2018, it was approximately $250,000. Um, we have now <clears throat> multiple federal grants, um, and importantly for multiple federal departments. So while we put all of our eggs in one basket, we have multiple birds that contribute to that. Um, so we get money from the Department of Justice and the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as at the state level through the Targeted Community Alternatives to Prison, Franklin County Public Health, um, two forms of that, one their local grant and the other um, their Center for Disease Control grant, and then private foundation money through the John T. and Catherine D. MacArthur Foundation. So we continue to do the programs that we talked about last year. Um, they remain just as innovative as before, and the continuation of this programming includes monthly prison inreach, monthly resource events, frequent user housing for folks who are in and out of the jail, and LGBTQ specific programming within the reentry and justice field. And while we throw a great deal of our support behind the Denial Ohio campaign, our office works beyond Denial Ohio. We work in the Get Connected to Care Ohio space with Whitehall Safe Stations, the I Need to Carry Narcan in My Neighborhood, the Use a Clean Needle, um, or Get Me Connected to Medically Assisted Treatment. So we are further down into the sort of daily funk, if you will, of the clients who need our services the most. We are replicating our success. Um, our Pathways for Program for Women as you know, commissioners, has been nationally recognized by the National Association of Counties, the National Sheriff's Association, the National Criminal Justice Association, and is mentioned multiple times from the floor of the U.S. Senate by Senator Portman um, as being uh, a best practice and an innovative uh, methodology that folks should aim to replicate. Building on that success, we have closed the RFP or in active negotiations at the moment. We should have selected a vendor and launched the Mail Pathways program within the next 30 days. And we're extremely committed to supporting the commissioner's priorities, um, specifically as this impacts the Rise Together anti-poverty plan, as well as Franklin County Public Health social determinants of health, um, and a direct commitment to recognize that people of color 
have for 400 years categorically been by design victims of the system. For 265 years, they weren't people, they were chattel slaves. And for the next 165, the only way we could continue to have those folks work without paying them was to incarcerate them. It's actually in the Constitution. They're the only folks who can be enslaved is if you're incarcerated. So we changed out one for the other. And we realized that we have a very strong commitment to, to taking this issue on and not looking at how do we create a system that's not racist, but how do we create a system that is markedly anti-racist. Um, one of my favorite musicals, which will come as no surprise to anybody, is, thank you, is Sweeney Todd. Um, and in that, Sweeney Todd says to Mrs. Lovett, the mystery of the world, my sweet, is who gets eaten and who gets to eat. And we look at a world where hopefully someday we can't tell who's at the table and who's on the menu simply based on the color of their skin from this photograph. We're actively working to decriminalize poverty. I think that was a picture of John and I when we were little. <laughs> Actually, I'm pretty sure that's us, John. You think? I think that's us, man. I think that's where uh, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it is us, man. Maybe. Yeah. Everybody's was, looking as though they believe I was, me. I was bald when I was at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you where I got that. I'm sorry, Director. It's all right. Yeah, yeah. Considering I was a teenager when you were that little. <laughs> That's not true. You're not that much older. We are working to actively decriminalize poverty and to undo some of that criminalization that has been baked into a system for quite some time, starting with a serious look at how we look at cash bail. <clears throat> your liberty should not depend upon your liquidity. It should depend upon how much danger you are to the community. And so we're looking at what do we do We're on cash bail? Um, what does that mean in terms of an enhanced use of uh, pretrial screening tools, um, of, um, of pretrial supervision, et cetera? And on the other side, and we are reaching out right now um, to Arnold Ventures to become part of a pilot study of counties across the country looking at fines and fees as they impact the court system. Um, and so we'll be looking at that from, from two different angles. Partly we'll be looking at fines and fees that are assessed um, at the time one goes to court. Um, so um, court costs that are assessed if you get arrested and are brought in, whether your case is dismissed or not, um, and, and other things. Um, but also looking at the fines and fees that become barriers then to trying to help improve your, your record. What if you don't have the money to file for an expungement? Or what if you don't have the money to file for a certificate of qualification for employment? Um, are we really continuing to perpetuate poverty by putting in place these 50, 75, 100, $150 barriers um, that if they weren't there, folks would be able to clear their records or not have this type of, say, collection report, et cetera. So we're looking at all of those things very actively in 2020. And you're making so many friends on the first bail reform. So many. <laughs> so many friends. I have people who love me I didn't even know loved me before. Our newest grant commissioners, as you're aware, is <clears throat> through the Second Chance Act Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency and Prevention, yeah. and it's a $673,000 grant over the next year specifically to look at children with incarcerated parents and look at trauma mitigation, resource supports for those families, programming for those parents, et cetera. I'd like to take just a moment to kind of give you an idea of what the magnitude of this problem is um, nationwide. We all paid close attention to the news earlier this year when um, the administration began stopping families at the southern border and separating families and children at the southern border. Um, and as appalling as that is, there was a total of 2,700 brown children who were separated from their families at the southern border this year. Every day in America, 21,000 children are separated from their families by incarceration, and roughly 12,000 of those are brown and black children. Mm -hmm. So we're doing 10 times as much, six to 10 times as much damage in a day with incarceration as we're doing a year on the southern border with immigration policy. I think we can't forget that. I think we can't forget that when we reach into a home and remove a parent, perhaps for very, very good reason that that parent gets arrested. 
but we are immediately inflicting a state-inflicted trauma upon that child. We are laying an adverse childhood experience directly on the shoulders of that child. And we are potentially delivering state-induced pathway to poverty to the folks who are left behind, mm -hmm. especially if we're removing the breadwinner, whether that breadwinner was making his or her money uh, in the legal or illegal economy. So I think while we have to look at the right thing to do from crime and incarceration, we have to recognize that there are folks who are left behind um, who are dramatically impacted by that action and that we have, if we have a responsibility to remove that person from the home, we have a responsibility to reach back in and protect the people that we leave behind. We're very serious about that. We're very serious about creating a program around that, doing a pilot, but then also looking at partnering with our sister agencies such as Job and Family Services and others to see what can we do essentially with no cost to us, but just by paying more attention to who the families are that are impacted in this way, and how can we be more proactive in engaging those folks? Well, un unofficially, we saw the families of those folks that we, we saw incarcerated, many of them go into foreclosure easily. Um, I, you know, we didn't do a pilot, but we saw that happen time and time. There's a higher yeah. eviction rate. Sure. Um, folks go into denial, so oh. they sort of don't contact yeah. us immediately. And by the way, the state were the ones who took somebody out of the so house. I'm so really, why would I immediately trust to call you and say absolutely. help? Absolutely. So um, I'm really glad you're taking an intentional look at this. It's really important. We'll have folks who will wait for 30, 45, 50 days until they get a three-day notice on the door. And then we're all in crisis mode. Yeah. If we had reached out proactively, could we have done something to have intercepted that early on and to not have then thrown that family into crisis and potentially thrown that family into poverty? Well, and you know child support isn't being paid and all of the cascading effects of that. Precisely. So thank you for taking a, a, an and so, organized look at it. Thank you. And so just as we're looking at the youngest residents and how they're being impacted by the incarceration of their parents, so are we looking at the older residents of Franklin County and what's the, the impact of any, the intersection of incarceration and aging. Um, so um, when someone um, is an older offender, um, it is more difficult to age at home in the community. Um, if you need in-home health care, it's almost impossible to find a health care agency that will send someone into your home to take care of you. If you need congregate health care, such as a nursing home or a convalescent facility, there is one in the state of Ohio that will take you if you have a felony conviction and their waiting list is, is extremely long. And so we have to do better than that. We have to look at alternative solutions. While well, we did write for and not receive a grant this year to specifically look at this intersection, uh, Director Missler and I and other partners remain committed to doing what we can on a smaller scale and at least beginning to prove some concepts and you have our assurance that we will indeed write for that grant again next year. Looking at implementing some leading edge vulnerability reduction technology, you've seen these contracts come forward before, but with the brave buttons in congregate housing such as at the YMCA where people can call for help, the mobile applications for folks who are in active addiction or who are in active sexual survival uh, work. Um, and then for folks who are in recovery uh, applications such as the Anchor to Hope, Anchor for Me. Um, we're looking at making sure that we can distribute as much technology as possible. Um, that technology can be um, omnipresent. That technology can be 24-7. Uh, and folks will have access to that. But Technology doesn't replace people. Um, and so, um, as you've all seen this quote before, that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, the opposite of addiction is connection. We have to have, as the Adam Board talked about, child support uh, and children's services talked about, um, we have to have peer support specialists, people who have walked the walk, who can go out and talk to other clients uh, and really make an impact there. Uh, we were talking about making sure that they're paid a living wage, I'm proud to, uh, announced that um, none of the programming that we do in our office uh, do we pay our peer support specialists less than $20 an hour. Uh, we feel that what they do is critically important and we want to make sure that they aren't um, starving while they're doing it. I'm also extremely proud of the staff that we have, of the 18 staff and contractors that we have. Um, 
in our department, fully 40% of us are in some sort of recovery and 40% have some sort of justice involvement. Those groups overlap but are not identical. Um, and uh, so you can come into our office and you can talk to somebody who's been there, done that. We're looking at implementing some neighborhood level interventions this year, continuing what we're doing uh, or, or what is being done, but, but ratcheting it up a little bit um, for mayor's court intervention in the city of Whitehall, and that's expanding also to the city of Reynoldsburg to catch folks early on in those courts who most of the issue is, I can't get a job because I can't pass a weed test on Monday, or I can't show up to work on time because I partied too much on Friday night those kinds of things that we can get in early and, and nip in the bud. We're also partnering with the Shelter Board and other partners. We've done a survey. We sent out over 24,000 surveys. We got back about 3,400 responses. So I was pretty happy with that, of landlords throughout the city to say, do you rent to people with eviction records? Do you rent to people with credit scores lower than 550? Do you rent to people with criminal histories? Um, and if not, what would it take? to get you to do that. If we were to put a damage mitigation fund behind that, if we were to put up additional monies for additional deposits, what would it take to do that? Um, we're just now beginning to dissect through those data. We are happy to have been a supporting partner on this, letting the shelter board take the lead. Um, obviously, they have constituents who are far even outside of our justice involved group. Um, but we believe that we have some room for landlord education and we have some room to follow some structures that have been put in place in other municipalities where for uh, potentially a small amount of dollars we can make a large impact in the um, comfort level of landlords and therefore the number of folks who are willing to rent to folks that heretofore they might not have considered as potential uh, leasees. Told you we have the greatest slides. There's a a quote that says, you run with your legs to be fast, you run with your mind to be faster, and you run with your heart to be unstoppable. Um, our department is unstoppable. At the national level, you'll see these are a variety of organizations that we are proud to be a part of the national leadership. Not to be outdone, not to offend my cat-loving friends. <laughs> we also have large roles at the state and local leadership level um, for a variety of different things. Um, and in homage to last year's slide, if you'll remember, it was the uh, dogs pulling the, the, the sled. Uh, this year's quote on this slide is that cats are smarter than dogs. You could never get eight cats to pull a sled through the snow. <laughs> I'm the luckiest guy in the, part, in the, in the uh, county. I get to go to work every day with my very own women's national team. I have <laughs> truly world-class folks who work for us. Uh, that, that's actually Melissa dressed as Megan Rapinoe, by the way. Um, but I have the, we have the best team, and it is a women's national team. I'm the only boy in the office. Um, we, we line them up, we knock them down, we really turn things out. I have a team that I would put up against any of my counterparts anywhere in the country, any of the counties that we go to. Um, I'd put up what we do and know they can't have my team. Special shout out to um, the sort of adjunct members of our team, LaGrita and Carla, we could not do this without you guys, so thank you. Um, and then Ken and Chris, your support has just been um, uh, amazing with all the ancillary things that we do in law enforcement, PFM, and all those other places that we reach out to, so thank you very much. But commissioners, this is why we do the work that we do. Last year I told you the story of Miss Stella, who was signing her first lease. This is Jacqueline Holler. Jacqueline was in our office just a couple of days ago, by the way. The photographs that you see on the left are from 2015, 16, 17, and 18. And those are one of the mug shots that she had each of those years, one of. A year ago, she was homeless, she was addicted. Her quote is, I went through several overdoses and only by the grace of God am I still here. She enrolled in the Pathways program, excelled, was connected to the Job and Family Services Building Futures program, went to Impact, went through that program. Um, while there was living in Pathways Supported Housing, she's now moved out of her Pathways Supported Housing. She has her own apartment. She's purchased her own car, and she's a journeyman's apprentice with Iron Workers Local 172. Um, it works. Residents like Jacqueline are the reason that we do this work. Um, we have 
multiple of these stories. We try to pull one or two out every year to talk about. But this is why we do what we do. She came in the other day, and she's like, I'm sorry that I smell like iron and grease. And I said, I'm not. I like the fact that you smell like iron and grease because it smells like money. Um, and hats off to our friends in the trades for being willing to be part of that program and being willing to give some like, someone like Jacqueline what is perhaps a fifth or a sixth or a seventh chance um, to get into a career that she loves and that she can, can support herself and her family. Hey, before you move on, I just said that she was also the speaker at the uh, Building Futures, yes. if I remember correctly, and was amazed. And it, and it really is um, um, uh, illustrative of what this represents. And I thought that she was amazing then and didn't have her full background. She talked about it at the because she had a, I mean, she had a friend in the audience. They had kind of gone through it together. <coughs> it was a, a male mm -hmm. friend. But the point I was going to make was her leadership now affects more than what you do. Her leadership affects people in their trenches mm -hmm. and you know having issues too, as, as evidenced by her friend that she had pointed out and that they chose her to speak. Absolutely. Future, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And her colleagues, who are by and large male, yeah. um, see her and see people, and not only do they see women, but they see women who've been caught up in that cycle of addiction and, and arrest and perhaps other unsavory activities in a completely different way now. She's an ambassador mm -hmm. for, you know, it works if you work it. And she worked it. She knows how to do and this. We hard. could not possibly be more proud of her. Um, yeah, she did all the hard work, right? All we did was give her a clear lane to go in. She's the one who went. And we really um, were humbled by being able to do that. And she's you know, one of multiple stories that we could tell every year. But we always like to put somebody up on a slide and show them off a little bit. You make it real and you make it, I mean, this, this is the work. And the this work is, the is work. hard work, and it's good work. This is the Thank work. Hard you. work is hard, but hard work is, hard. is uh, rewarding. In closing, commissioners, thank you. Thank you for your courage to take on what are uncomfortable and sometimes controversial conversations and solutions. Um, thank you for your commitment to smart justice, and thank you for your confidence in our team to be able to carry out this work every day and make the changes to the community that we hope we're making. And I'd be happy to take any questions that any of you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank nice you. job. Thanks for the uh, entertaining presentation as well. <laughs> we tried. Yeah, it was very thoughtful. We're working on these is about the 1st of October. Because yeah. i got to get just the right picture. Yes, you do. Getting that picture of you and Commissioner O'Grady was difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Even though he was an upperclassman, I was, you know. You looked yeah. old. I looked old. Right? Or he looked yeah. young. <laughs> for his age. West Side and East Side coming together. <laughs> Thank you. I never had a babysitter that wasn't one of my family members. <laughs>